So why is music pleasurable? What, why does music have the power that it so often has? I mean, we, we kind of know this just from our personal experiences, but do we, do we know what's happening in the brain to explain that? Well, Satori and, and Blood did a, a study a while back that looked at, and it was interesting because they, they looked at music that gave people chills. And the music that they looked at was um, important to the individual person, but of course the five or ten musicians that they studied, each person had their own particular music that gave them the chills. And what they did for the study was to, uh, they used each other's music as a control. So the piece <laughs> of music that would make you excited or feel really good would make me feel good. And, and it's interesting because over, over a lifetime, of course, we start creating these responses to music that then become wired. But you're also suggesting that we have specific music memories. Right. And, and maybe that's and, and, a different kind of memory and, and, than and the when, other kinds of memories And when the people have, have the chills, uh, certain neurochemicals get released. So when you hear a piece of music that makes you feel good, there's actual chemical changes in your brain in that moment. Otherwise, you wouldn't have those feelings. So we, we develop those tastes and those responses, though, I believe, through experience over time. So um, music doesn't necessarily turn everybody on the same way. I mean, pleasure is a very limited criterion, uh, if you think <laughs> about it. Uh, we listen to very sad music. We listen to music that's very angry. We're, uh, so I think the notion that we listen to music just for pleasure or something to be pleasing is very limited. Yes, yeah. we do that a lot, uh, but uh, if you're, for example, uh, if, you're, if, if somebody in your family is sad, we have this false uh, tendency to think, oh, let's play them something happy and we'll cheer them <laughs> up. Well, they're going to say, stop it. I don't want to listen to that. I want to listen to something sad. And, and they're going to resonate to sad music if they're sad. And they're going to resonate to happy music if they're happy. And so there's the, the notion of resonance or synchronization okay. is much more important than somehow sort of making you happy or lifting up your yeah. spirits. And that, that's, that's important because, you know, in the field of music therapy, there's a, a term called the ISO principle, where you really meet the patient where they're at at that moment. And the only way music could really be effective is to really be able to touch them where they're feeling or how they're feeling in that moment, to be able to allow them to release either emotionally or physically something that's been blocked otherwise. Well, it also sounds like you're saying that perhaps we haven't really developed a vocabulary to talk about emotion in music. I mean, the experience that we have is so much bigger and more yeah, complicated sure. than, than the language that we have for it. Uh, Charles, your sense? You know, I think it's important to point out here that there's a certain primitive neurobiology at play, meaning mm -hmm. that a lot of these reward systems or aversion systems that we have are our basic biology, yeah, things that motivate fear, hunger, thirst, mm -hmm. all these senses that really primitive survival instincts, mm -hmm. these are the things that can get stimulated by music. And it's a pretty interesting idea, especially when you think that music is really old. Okay? It's, <laughs> I mean, it's existed in every, I mean, every historical epoch that's ever been studied. I mean, 50,000 years ago, humans were making primitive musical instruments. I mean, 50,000 years ago, <laughs> out of bones of animals. It's a very peculiar behavior, especially when you're trying to survive. Yeah. And so there's, I think, a very close linkage between, to me, what is really the wonder of music, which is that this abstract acoustic vibration in the air leads to a deep emotional response. And to me, that's a remarkable process. And um, I mean, the feeling of it is so overwhelming. To try to study it scientifically is very daunting. I think also, just to touch back on the language and um, music comments that we were making, I hope, I, I know the neurobiology of this may be unclear. I, I hope everybody recognizes that the, the brain has a very clear anatomic structure. And we know, for the most part, what these things do, loosely speaking. but as we study these topics more, we're realizing that our models were a little too simplistic. Yeah. It's not that there's a music part of the brain. Right? There are parts of the brain that process complex sound, parts of the brain that right. process syntactic components of language and music, parts of the brain that process meaning, parts of the brain that process emotion, and they're all coordinated by this kind of executive frontal machinery. That is why I think music and language have so many of us, because they actually share some so similar things. neural architecture. I mean, the same neurons are involved in some of these language operations and these musical operations. It's just that the language studies came first. And so our first understanding of Broca's area was in a language capacity or a stroke that led to a language deficit that led to it being ascribed a language function. We know now that when two musicians 
play music back and forth and trading fours in a jazz gig, they're using Broca's area of the brain. Mm. No words are spoken. 